emerging legislation for money transmitters in North Carolina, which affects how Bitcoin is dealt with as part of that regulation. So since that is so topical and it is substantially not known much about, we thought we'd provide a meetup meet and perhaps others in the future uh, to educate Bitcoin advocates, business people, on what this regulatory requirement, or emerging regulatory set of uh, requirements are going to mean to digital currency and Bitcoin and, and the other digital currencies that are also emerging. So the purpose of this is education. Because I felt, as Dan and Robert and Rocco and the rest of the people who are, have co-organized this meetup, is there's a lot of misunderstanding of what this bill, the emerging Senate bill, is all about. Senate Bill 68, which you can find on the, the, the website. Many of you, I'm sure, have read it. So please take in this, the spirit of this meetup is to learn about what the bill is all about, what its purpose is, why it exists. I mean, everybody in the room understands that money transmission has been regulated for lots and lots of years. It's not a new subject at all. What's new, one of the main things that's new about it is that it now applies to virtual or digital currency, as well as all of what it did before. So, the rules of the game are, we're going to have some panel-driven questions to kind of level set some understanding of the bill. Then we're going to open it up for your questions as well. This is an informative session. This is not a bitch session. <laughs> Got me? So if you had a spear or something that you brought with you, put it, put it back in your car. <laughs> we have some distinguished panel members. I'd like to have them introduce themselves starting way over on the right here. Hi, I'm Erica Pierce. I'm with Guy Public Affairs. We are a public affairs <laughs> We're a public affairs company based out of D.C. that helps um, startups that work in highly regulated areas. And we have a strategic alliance with Perry Ann's group, the uh, Chamber of Digital Commerce. My name is Katie Boskin. I'm the bank supervision attorney with the Commissioner of Bank's office. Um, we are the sponsors of, uh, we call it House Bill 289, but I understand that we're referring to it as SB 16. So I'm here today to explain a little bit about our rationale there and how that works. Hi, my name is Perry Boring. I'm the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. We're a DC-based trade association that represents the interests of the digital asset, digital currency, Bitcoin, and blockchain campaigns. Hello, my name is Chris Emanuel, and it's an honor to be here. I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. Uh, my background is in politics. I am a North Carolina State lobbyist. Okay, with that, those are the introductions. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dan Spooler, who's going to conduct the uh, questioning from, from here, and then take your questions as well as, as we proceed through this. I'm sorry, I don't remember my own agenda. First, I want you to hear from Robert Sherwood, who is a Bitcoin advocate and businessman. Uh, as Bill said, my name is Rob Sherwood, and I'm the founder of BitBasics. We are a North Carolina-based uh, Bitcoin education advocacy nonprofit. Um, our, our entire goal uh, is to bring Bitcoin to the public uh, in easy to understand terms and phrases. Um, we really want to. Uh, uh, we really want to um, lower the learning curve uh, to get the general public into Bitcoin um, because it can be uh, daunting um, with all the information out there. So, um, like I said, we're a nonprofit. Uh, all of our activities are funded by donations, and uh, we are co organizers of this event. Um, uh, there's also an email sign up form. We will be um, collecting emails uh, and organizing an advocacy campaign digitally. Um, so if you would like to get involved, uh, 
please list your email. Um, we're going to have a website for uh, blogging, uh, social media. Um, anyone can write a guest blog on regulation or legislation or anything to do with Bitcoin in North Carolina. So if you would like to get involved, please go ahead and sign up. Thank you. Okay, again, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, my name is Dan Spooler, and I'm going to be moderating the questions section tonight, and then we'll move forward to the audience questions after we're done with the Q&A. So, uh, first question I'd actually like to ask uh, Ms. Catherine Boskin, Katie Boskin, from uh, the North Carolina Office Commissioner of Banks. Uh, essentially, what is the purpose of this proposed legislation, this bill? What business or currency regulatory problems is it trying to solve, specifically? So House Bill 289 um, is, a, is a revision to Article 16A of Chapter 53. Um, one thing that the Commissioner's Office discovered in 2013 was that uh, virtual currency was already covered in Article 16A. Um, so it was already within the framework of the law, but the existing Money Transmitter Act, which had been drafted in 2001, was inadequate to the challenge of addressing some of the peculiarities of, uh, of virtual currency transmitters. Our office discovered that in trying to address applications that we were receiving, um, that the 2001 law didn't provide the flexibility that many startups needed to make a go of their virtual currency transmission activity. Neither did it have the clarity that we felt was necessary for the industry to uh, understand what their regulatory obligations were. So to answer your question specifically, Dan, uh, 16B attempted to draft some clarity into the Money Transmitter Act to clarify what companies are in the scope and what companies are out. I know that there's a lot of questions about whether minors, for example, or end users are in the scope of the Transmitter Act, and the answer to both of those is no. Um, they are not within the scope. Um, neither are non-companies uh, who do not profit from the transmission of virtual currency. Uh, those, com those actors are not within the scope either. However, virtual currency exchangers, those companies that, uh, that exchange fiat currency for virtual currency, for profit are within the scope, as are wallet providers, hosted wallet providers, are also within the scope. So 16B, the purpose of, 16, of, of, of House Bill 289 or Senate Bill 680, was to clarify those provisions and then also to build in some flexibility into the, into the applications process and into the regulatory process. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Perry Ann, um, you know, we see throughout the country different states tackling different regulatory issues. Uh, specifically California, New York, and now North Carolina. Uh, what are other states doing at this point from the perspective of the Chamber of Digital Commerce? It can be very confusing for companies that are regulated under the Money Transmitter Acts. Uh, this is one of the biggest issues facing the digital currency industry. There's all sorts of business models in this space. Some of these business models are very clearly money transmitters, and they have to, one, uh, register with FinCEN on the federal level, and then they also have to register in every single state that they have customers in. Not every state that they have an office, every state they have a customer. And we're dealing with digital currency. Now these laws were written long before the internet even existed. So there's, it's now truly time to start updating some of these rules and regulations for these new types of business models. Uh, I will say, uh, I have traveled the country and I've worked with a number of different states who are trying to figure out how to regulate these new business models. This is not an easy task. Um, North Carolina is doing a great job of putting together a regulatory framework uh, and many companies in this space have been very vocal uh, that this is a better approach than what we've seen in other areas. One example is in New York. So New York was the first state that put forward any type of regulatory proposal. Uh, they did this on uh, th through the regulator, the Department of Financial Services. Um, California and North Carolina have, um, they're going through the legislative approach. Um, what New York did was they drafted a bit license. So it's a regulatory regime specific for virtual currency. Um, North Carolina is amending the existing Money Transmitter Act 
Uh, the Chamber does believe that this is a much better way to regulate virtual currency because it's a lot less onerous than drafting completely new regulation. So Chris, uh, Chris Emanuel, you, know, you, you lobby downtown a lot with the, the legislators down in Raleigh, and um, so you, you're pretty well averse on how they handle the issues down there, and you have a history of working with uh, some tech-related industries like UAVs, drones, other uh, tech-related uh, industries. Um, what direction do you see the state legislature moving um, with regards to this proposal? Who would stand to profit and lose, in your opinion? Well, that's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, first of all, let me say this. Um, I personally see uh, House Bill 289 uh, coming to uh, an end at the end of the session. Now, why do I say this? Because uh, the General Assembly has been in session now for quite some time, and they, they're anxious to get home. And I think that the budget is taking a lot of their time. I will also say, talking about this, that it would probably do the industry better, in my opinion, if this bill would die now and there would be an opportunity to revisit it starting January 1, where there could be a lot of additional uh, things that happen. Now, uh, who stands to profit? That's interesting. It just depends on who you are. And uh, let's uh, let's take the um, let's take the exchanges for example. Now we can break them down into two categories: an exchange that has the financial background can afford the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars net worth, but those that do not have that that are starting up may have to uh, find another way to do that. Now, the question is this, should we restrict digital currency exchanges, I'll just use that as an example, to those that can only afford to get into the game? Or, let me put it another way, would it do the state of North Carolina better to have more competition in this? from this aspect. Also, you can look at the, in uh, 16A, broker-dealers, of course I'm not an attorney, but I know that they're probably subject to, uh, I'm not sure if they're subject to all of uh, 16A or B, but there is some sort of exemption from what I read in there. And here again, the question is this, uh, what is digital currency? Uh, is it a commodity? What actually is it? Is it something that, um, what does the IRS say that it is? Okay, the, the IRS does not say that it's currency, is that correct? Is that correct? It's not considered concern? Property. All right, so then therefore it would be subject to long-term or short-term capital gains, correct? But if you sell shares of something, According to the SEC, Law 1933, 1934, my understanding is it does then become a security. So, who stands to benefit with this? I think the question, Dan, would be better this. Let's have legislation passed, let's pass this bill where competent people can get into the game after we have the safeguards to protect the public. Now, here's one other question, and I don't know the answer to this. If you're, maybe if there's a broker-dealer out there, they can tell me this. As a broker-dealer, if you're subject or you wanted to work Bitcoin or some other digital currency, could you then be subject to, to a less restrictive net worth requirement? Could you, could you also, could you also possibly be, uh, become a member of CIPIC, Securities Investor Protection Corporation, which in terms would safeguard up to five hundred thousand dollars. Am I getting yeah. along with no, that? No, so let's get some, you know, let's get some opinions on the panel. Yeah, okay. Let's take Erica or Katie and you. Should probably talk more, much more about that than I do, I'm sure. 
else like to take this? Yes. Right, uh, Dan, if we can narrow down the, the... Yeah, well, the question originally was, what, what, do, what direction do you see the North Carolina State Legislature moving regarding the current bill that's proposed? I mean, realistically, do you think it's going to happen uh, in the next couple of weeks? Are they going to punch it to the spring? Um, or is it, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, we know right now the, um, the legislature is heads, heads down, focus on the budget, and so it's, it's all about timing. Um, as um, you know, Chris said, uh, they're ready to, to end their session. <laughs> they're tired, um, so it, it looks like um, the bill may not make it out of this session. But some, you never know. They could, you know, clean up the budget in the next couple of days and. and focus on some last minute items and we've been told that this is a priority piece of legislation that they would like to, to, to move um, this session. But it's, it, in politics, as we all know, it's sort of, a, <laughs> it's always a million dollar question. Will it move, will it not move? Um, but it, it looks like right now it's, it's, it's bottlenecked. They're not having any more committee hearings. And so um, I believe the bill is right now in the Rules Committee, um, not there to die. As some have um, thought, but there because that's where they're moving everything right now to make won't get finished with the budget and focus on other other important areas, including this piece of legislation. If I can add on too, um, I think one important component, regardless of whether uh, SB 680 dies this session, um, is that it's coming back, and I say that because virtual currency transmission is already regulated under current law. Um, just without some of the additional features that you found, some of the, um, frankly, the stakeholder, the industry requested features that are in SB 680, um, a lot of the compromises that you see reflected in this legislation are not in the 2001 law. Um, so even if SB 680 dies this session, there's a good chance that we will be revisiting this either next year via legislation in a short session, or the commissioner's office will be revisiting the issues via the administrative rulemaking process. So either way, this is going to continue to, to percolate. Yeah, one of the things that I know a lot of us are concerned about is, you know, we hear uh, New York State bit license. Um, you know, a lot of folks consider that legislation to be a little too stiff, specifically for Bitcoin and Bitcoin 2.0 companies. And as a result, a lot of companies have led, left New York State. Uh, some of them leaving overseas, other will move to other states. Um, do you? What's your opinion on this North Carolina legislation? Could that lead to a same type of exodus of Bitcoin-related companies or you know digital virtual currency companies leaving the state because they may feel that the parameters are too 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 tough? Marianne? Yeah, there's been some companies who have publicly said that they would have to leave, and I think there already was one company that did leave. Um, the problem is, is that where are you going to go? Because 47 states regulate money transmission, so you can try to go somewhere else, but you can't really escape the issue. And if you're dealing with American consumers at the end of the day, you're gonna have to deal with this regulatory requirement. Um, very specifically, what we are talking about here is the issue of money transmission. So if you're exchanging one currency to another, dollar to Bitcoin, Bitcoin to fuel coin, Bitcoin to Dogecoin, Dogecoin to dollar, that is money transmission. That is highly regulated. That, that, that function has been regulated long before Bitcoin's existence. That's fair game to regulate because there's money laundering issues uh, and there's you know, a multitude of reasons of why there's a regulatory environment in place for that. Uh, the issue that I think a lot of people have concerns with are what about other types of business models? So I gave uh, some of our colleagues here an example today about um, using the blockchain for other types of use cases. Um, one really cool example that I got to learn about a couple weeks ago when I participated in a conference um, in uh, New Hampshire is a project that's being incubated in, at MIT, uh, and they're using the Bitcoin blockchain to issue birth certificates um, in countries like in Bangladesh. Uh, human trafficking is a major social issue, and the government has really been incapable of producing these public documents, and because of it, there's a huge human trafficking issue um, in, that, uh, in that region. Um, so potentially, using the public decentralized ledger of the blockchain, you can issue a public uh, birth certificate on this public distributed ledger. So the concerns that I think 
the Chamber and some others have is you're using the blockchain, there's a transaction that's taking place, but it's not necessarily a currency transaction. You're using this for a non-currency specific purpose. You're issuing a digital asset. That's the difference between Bitcoin as a digital asset versus a currency. If we're looking at it as a currency function, that's fair games, that's money transmission, the AML, KYC, the BSA applies, that should be regulated. If you're using it for something completely different that has nothing to do with finance, money transmission, there's not a risk of money laundering, there's no consumer risk, that's a completely different issue and that should not be regulated under the Money Transmitter Act. And our legal counsel has advised us that the way that the definition is written, some companies that are using the blockchain for alternative purposes potentially could interpret this to be that they would need a license. Uh, so the only concern that we have is just that those types of business models would not be looped into these types of laws. And that's when it's very clear that um, when we're putting together new types of regulatory or legislative uh, proposals for virtual currency that we're clearly making a distinction between Bitcoin's use as a currency versus the blockchain software for other purposes. I'll just go ahead and tell you that's not within the scope of the Money Transmitter Act. So the Office of Commissioner of Banks is solely concerned with virtual currency that is convertible virtual currency, uh, consistent with the FinCEN requirement as well. The office neither has the resources nor the inclination to address real property transfers, birth certificate issuances, any of the other smart property type of contracts that may occur on the blockchain. Folks, uh, let's make no mistake about this. Um, everybody takes care of themselves, right? Now, the banking industry this, in my opinion, is a potential threat to the banking industry. When you pay your Visa card and your MasterCard, whatever they get, one and a half or two and a half percent, whatever it is, everybody takes care of their own business, right? As it should be. Now, those that are, why is it a threat? It's a threat because this type of digital currency, what does it do? It's, it allows you to transmit currency at a, at a lesser rate. The 2% is gone. So what needs to be done? Uh, I'm just, just curious, uh, how many people out here are in, in business with this the digital currency? Okay, so there's a few of you. Okay, very good. What has to be done is you have to protect your own interest. You have to form an organization to raise capital so that people can hear what needs to be done. Education needs to be done. You have to talk these. You talk to the state legislators in North Carolina. They want what's best for the citizen. If it's cheaper rates, competition is a great thing. So look at or consider having people take care of your end or what benefits you. Believe me, the banks have all the lobbyists and they're there every day. They can take care of these things, so that's my opinion. Yeah, well, and uh, Katie, the question I had actually, and this is probably a lot of folks' minds, um, is the, the capital requirements. So it's something that I'm not really clear on still, and maybe you can uh, help explain, because I know a lot of folks probably have questions on it, was the, this $250,000 figure and the $150,000 surety bond figure. Can you, can you explain what that's all about, just so we know from your perspective? Sure. Um, those are, so most of you probably don't realize them, that banks are typically chartered with $10 million in capital. That's a baseline minimum. Um, trust companies, uh, and I raise this because New York just chartered a trust company for virtual currency exchange um, with a, a similar capital requirement. Um, so those are for bank depository institutions, a $10 million baseline net worth. Money transmitters, both in the 2001 law and in this new revised law, have a $250,000 net worth requirement. And that's simply because if, if you are going to be entrusted with the movement of other people's money, uh, 
the, the commissioner's office believes that you should have some minimum degree of responsibility and uh, substantial substantialness to back that commitment up. Um, so the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar net worth is contained in the two thousand one the existing law, um, as is the one hundred and fifty thousand dollar surety bond requirement. Um, in, in recognition of the fact that, that smaller players here will be entering the marketplace, um, the startup companies, if you will, those thresholds are as low as they can be to meet that minimum financial responsibility component. Okay. Now, um, our master ceremony is here. Bill Warner has a question. <laughs> this is very good simple. So, what? One of the ways I think people will understand this is we can explain to them who does this apply to and who does it not apply to. You've already answered some of that already. So, and this simple-minded view of if, if I buy Bitcoin, I'm a consumer, I buy Bitcoin and I go buy something with it and they take it out of my wallet. Am I a money transfer? No. Transmitter? I don't think so. No, you are not. Good. So anybody that puts money in their wallet, downloads a wallet, puts Bitcoin on it, and uses it, they're cool. Right, and if you... Now, if I, I'm an old guy, as you notice, sometimes I, I, I can't... I have not noticed that. <laughs> I paid her to say that. And I, I buy 10 Bitcoin. I wanted to buy this great thing down at Sears, though. Now accepting Bitcoin, I'm making that up. I transmit my 10 Bitcoin to my son Brian, who goes down there and buys the thing for me. Did I commit a transmitter act in so doing? I'm not in the business of Bitcoin, which as Bill says. No. That's the answer I thought I'd get. So, some people have asked me the question, well, if I do that, I become a transmitter? The answer is no, because this way this is written is you've got to be in the business of business to, you got to be making a profit or charging people for a service or something like that. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So now we get into the more sophisticated stuff, which I think all is yes. If I am selling Bitcoin to someone else, so I'm, the person for whom I bet, bought my Bitcoin is regulated by this. They're in the business of selling Bitcoin. Typically, yes. Oh, there's exceptions? There can be, depending on the model. Um, Clear it up. <laughs> I don't think that I, I, I can give you the, the range of business models that are prevalent in this area, frankly. Um, we encounter a bunch of different types of models. Um, as Perry Anna mentioned, these models change every day. Mm -hmm. um, but typically, if you are organized with the goal of changing fiat dollars into Bitcoin and you do that via some sort of hosted wallet solution, yep. then you will be within the scope of the Transmitter Act. Okay. I think that's good enough for now. So, if you're in the first of all, you got to be in the business of it. Correct. And and if you are, and you're transmitting through some electronic means, Bitcoin from for dollars or yen or whatever the heck you pay for this stuff in, you're a transmitter and you're regulated by this act. Right? Correct. That would also mean then the Bitcoin or other digital currency uh, exchanges and networks would all be regulated by this because they're in the business of it, they're charging for their traffic, all, all that stuff. Correct. Okay. What's the other question I had is that are there some minimal thresholds because of course everybody knows there's like the local bitcoins.com so I buy three bitcoins and I sell it to Bill and I do profit on it and I under, under IRS I would have to disclose that. But is, it, is there a minimum threshold that if, if I do that once a week and I make, is it, are there some minimum thresholds there before it becomes money transmission? Right, so if your profit is solely from the exchange rate, the current exchange rate,